Great to see many of you back this week. We are actually, if you miss a class, they are now posted, the first class is posted on our internet site. Just go to Greater Grace Community Church YouTube, type that out, and you, it will come up as one of the things you can see. So you can review that way, or if you miss one, you can see it. We're going to do that regularly. Thank Bob, who, who downs all these and sets them up for me. And Jacques, who does our camera work here. And Matt, who is a great resource in Hebrew and teaching with this. A lot of people get involved in this thing. But that will be a resource. We're working on streaming live so that if we have an overflow and the room out there, people can actually see it while we're watching it in here. So, pray for Paul Sickles. He says he can do it. I hope he can get it done. All right? Well, anyways, I handed him the stuff and said, try it. So, we're going to pray, get started, continue uh, with great things from the Bible through biblical numerology. Father, bless this to us. Speak to our hearts. These doctrines are important, Father. Help us to have a heart to take them and live by them. And then really, the people see Christ when we, when we believe your word and live by it. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen. Okay. amen, amen. For number one, Matt is going to try to key in, start by keying in on first the number, the Hebrew letter for it, what that means, and how that develops in a theme. Because number one is God's number. I'm going to give you four different reasons for it. He's going to develop it right from the Hebrew letter. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, we talked about this last week. Um, first letter of the alphabet is Aleph. That's what it looks like. Okay? If you'll notice, the word for one, for the cardinal one, is Echad. It starts with an Aleph. Okay? Um, we're going to hopefully get to this if I have time. Rishon is the first. It's the ordinal one. Like so first, second, third. That means first, first, second, third. Okay? So it is the first. In the first day of creation, Rishon is not used. Every other day of creation, the ordinal is used. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Let me, let me add to that. If you have a King James Bible or a New King James, it will say first, second, third, fourth day of creation. It is not accurate. The first day is day one. Day one. After that, it's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, right. seventh. So you start with one, and then you switch. And the, and the question is why? Matt's going to get into that. I'm going to try. Um, okay, so why is this? Better shape back in Reshet beginning. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. Better shape bara Elohim. In beginning, creates God. Okay? Reshet is related to this Rishon. Okay? It's from the same basic word group, which the basic meaning of it is head, the topmost, okay. the first. Okay? So, when he says Bereshith, he's saying in the beginning, and it's related to this Rishon. And Hebrew would normally take this and put it at the end. It's, it's a normal way to make what we call a, par a parallelism, where everything kind of fits together and reinforces each other. And when that parallelism isn't used, there's usually a reason. In fact, I think there's always a reason. Sometimes I can't figure out what it is. I think I figured this one out. So a cod means united only one. Rishon means first in the series. Okay? He wants us to know that it took one day. It didn't take eight billion years. It took one day. For God to rough out the rough edges of creation, the heavens and the earth, that's everything, right? Then he fills it on, the, uh, dresses it up, and, and makes it perfect in these remaining days. And he perfects it with his rest. I'm going to switch, okay? I've dealt with verses 1 through 5 of Genesis 1. I'm going to switch over real quick to Judges. Judges 3, 15 through 30, talks about Ehud, son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a left-handed man. 
Benjamin is the smallest tribe in Israel. If you look at a map of the old ancient tribes, you'll see it's stuck between four other tribes, Judah, Ephraim, uh, Reuben, <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, oh gosh, and Dan. Okay? Stuck between four different tribes. Just north of Judah. But just north of Judah, but it's the smallest of the tribes. Ehud means Ahad. It spells a little bit different, but it means the same thing. Ehud is the second of the judges, but guess what? Ehud had peace for 80 years. For 80 years. The longest peace Israel ever recorded was under this guy, and he's from the smallest number. His father was Gera, which means a grain. Think of a piece of rice, or barley, or wheat. It was the smallest measure in the Hebrew in the Hebrew measuring system. And he was what? He was a left-handed man, which in Hebrew means his right hand was kind of crippled. It was bound up. And the right hand is usually thought of as being the strongest. Yes. Well, guess what? He was crippled in his right hand in his strength. That's the way a Hebrew would think of it. In fact, most ancient peoples did. There's something weird about the left hand. I got a, a left-handed son, just so you know. <laughs> anyway. Um, Another couple things for just a couple more minutes. When he says, Bereshith bara Elohim, bara is used several times throughout this creation week. Bara comes from a, a verb, it means something like cutting. To create by cutting. To create by cutting, by graving something out, digging in, okay? But bara is related to barith, covenant. This is God as the covenant God. God as the covenant God. And who is this? To us there is one Father and one Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Look it up. After the class is over, when you got some time, please look up this. Look up Chapter 3, 15 through 30 of Judges. Look up chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 of Genesis. Get it in your soul. Meditate on it. We could all go on for the rest of eternity just talking about these things. We really could. Okay? I'm going to stop. I want you to think. This is about God the Father. He's the covenant God. The Father makes the most the most common covenant in all of human life happens every day. Marriage. Mm -hmm. And the Father is the one who arranged the marriage. Anyway. Okay. All right. When I looked at that, Matt pointed out to me, I looked in different translations so I could find it on day one, and then and then and instead of saying day two, it says day second. Actually, that's a literal in Hebrew, day third, day fourth, why? And it has to do with that united, it means only one God, but united, it speaks to the uni unity of the Trinity. They are in complete agreement. They got together on this thing, no questions, united, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit says, we're going to do it. <laughs> and in that first day, you can see the Spirit hovers over the face of the waters, also, God the Father is making covenant, yeah. and, and God the Son is creating light. In Him was light, and the light was the life of men. John. Mm -hmm. So we're all three members of the Trinity operating in unity, and that's stressed in that day one, <coughs> united. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's see, what, let's just test your memory a little bit here. We looked at, we said God's number is number one. What was the, write down the reasons we've given you that, for that already, on your board. See how your memory is. Why is God's number number one? Make a little list if you can. Some of them I haven't covered, but your comments weren't. I mentioned your comments. Some of you knew several of them before I taught them. Why is God's number number one? Put it on your board. I understand this is seven days ago. Both the verses? Or which the... means, you know, it's, it's like, that's ancient history to remember, but give it a try. Somebody will come up with it. And some will do that real smart thing, look at their notes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you 
said, why, why do you use those whiteboards, Pastor? And I, was, I started because I couldn't hear well when students were giving responses. If they write them on the board, I could see them. But then I realized if I call on someone, I find out that one person in the class knows what they're doing. If I use whiteboards, I can look around and see how many of you are really with me. So, it's a, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Michelle remembers the, the first verse we cover only one God. And we said that there are at least 28 verses in the Old Testament that tell us there is only one God. Okay? That was one of the things we looked at. Let me see some of the other responses because there's... You yeah. mentioned here the, uh, the unity of the Trinity. Unity, oneness. Unity is expressed by the word oneness in the scriptures, and we, we haven't even looked at that, but that is part of why number one is God's number. It expresses unity, oneness, one God. Let's see. Interest three and one, yeah. Let me see if I see any other interesting responses here. Okay. Interesting, one way to God. Yeah, we did actually look at that because it's one God and one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I haven't even particularly looked at that, but it's absolutely true. There is one way to God. And let's see. Yeah, everything starts with God. That's what we're going to get into today. Very good. Let me see. Trinity. Complete. Yes. His completeness. Okay, those are, those are all reasons why you express that with number one. Very good. Well, let's continue with those. And... The, the second reason I want to cover, I don't know one is more important than the other, but I found at least four things that are really important for someone to know and to live by. So, the second reason we're going to look at here is, I call it first things first. God is represented by the number one in the scriptures as both a cardinal number one, or one as an ordinal number, first, second, first. Because he came first, he was in existence before there was a creation. You could then say that God is first ordinally in order. He came first, he was first. Now, of all the ideas in the Bible, the one that short circuits my brain the most, we have an almighty, all-powerful God who knows all things. But where did God come from? The answer, he has always been. Right there, my brain goes, how can you have an almighty, all-powerful, all-wise God that's always been, where did he come from? And a short circus there. Because the scriptures are clear. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He has always been. My brain cannot even begin to compute that. I got anybody else out there that blows them right away? Yeah. Duh, oh God, whatever. You're there. We have the witness of creation. He created this. He's all-powerful. We look at his creation. Uh... Actually, there, if you, you one sextillion uh, stars, known stars, to one septillion stars in the universe. Uh, obviously, we have a God with all power, but he, he, the scriptures are clear. He has always been, Amen. and because different ancient people and modern people can't figure that one out, they try to come up with alternatives, which are all wrong. He has just always been. So when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? I am. Because I have always been. I am. And I always will be. And I always was. He expressed that way. Now, some scriptures for that. I'm going to give you just two. We're actually going to go short on this one. It's kind of self-apparent. In Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That verse alone is very clear. Uh, the psalmist here makes it clear. You have always been. You have always will be. You are the eternal one. First things first. So we express that with a number one. We'll, we'll back it up with a verse in Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 11, and just this part B of this verse covers it. Before me there was, uh, was no God formed. No gods before me. Nor shall there be after me, and there will be no gods after me. Just me. Matter of fact, I don't. I don't have to remember. There's another person. Isaiah says, "You know, I don't know of any other gods. I, I don't see any around." And I would know. I'm God. Yeah. He's he's kind of satirical. He's kind of pompous there. But you know, that's that's what we know. So we're going to leave that 
that is a reason because he was first and is first ordinarily in order. He was before the creation. He is, he is number one or first. Let's go to our third reason here. We're going to take more time with this. If you will, he is worthy of preeminence in all things. Amen. He's the most important. And that's the preeminence. He is deserving of most attention and praise. Preeminence has all those things. The most important thing in the universe is God and our relationship with Him. So because He has the preeminence, He has always had the preeminence. As a matter of fact, in this age, He allows people to run around without Him being preeminent. And that's man's problem. I can take care of myself and run my own affairs. It's sort of like jumping off the Empire State Building and say you're doing fine until you hit the cement. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is this is the lost man. He's in a free fall. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And your life is a vapor and squat. You know, really. So he is allowing this period of time where people can exalt themselves and take the preeminence, but it's a failure. And we see it in the scriptures. We see it in modern culture. We see it in people we know. But we learn to give him the preeminence. Amen. Amazing things happen when he, when we, he, what he says, what he thinks, what he wills, becomes most important to us. So, put it this way: in, you know, this is part of your homework in Colossians uh, one seventeen and one eighteen. He is before all things, Amen. and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. We're learning to do that. Now, I will share a little story about this. I have a habit, when we plan a vacation, I put the thing before God. Where we're going, when we're going, are we going to fly, are we going to take a boat, are we going to take a car? I pray about those things. And it's amazing how well they work. I can tell you, in, on one hand, the times when I didn't do that. They're the most amazing disaster stories of my life. <laughs> The most recent one is we're, we're in Budapest, Hungary. We have a week off. We want to go somewhere. We pick a site, and we're looking at places to stay. And my wife says, oh, that one's cheapest. I just say, take it. Did not pray. We get to the hotel. We knock on the door. The place is absolutely closed. There's not a soul in sight, and we're five minutes from town, and the sun is about to set. I'm like, quick, I'm going through my phone trying to find a cab company that took us here to go pick us up again and take us back to town because we actually booked a hotel that was closed. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time I did that on vacation, just, I just take the whole price, don't pray, don't, don't, we'll be fine. I got on a, a 24 hour sleeper car going from, uh, from uh, Germany, oh, Holland, to um, Sweden. And they mixed up our order, and instead of a sleeper car, I was in a smoker. <laughs> and every one of that car spent, tw it seemed like everybody in that cab spent 24 hours chain smoking. I get this migraine headache, it's the only time I ever thought of mass murder. <laughs> my head is pounding, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna kill it. So that was my, so when I take a vacation, I want God to have the one preeminence. Check with him what? First. Now what does the scripture say? Pray about what? Everything. Everything. So when you start planning things, you learn in that area to give God the preeminence. The same can be due to your marriage. What did the scripture say about my marriage? And let them be preeminent in how I conduct myself with my husband and wife. The same with your church. Every You learn to give God preeminence in different areas. Because you say, Jesus saved me a sinner doesn't mean he's got preeminence in anything yet. <laughs> Really, except the fact that you know you need to be saved. You're just, you learn to give him preeminence. So, we went through this. Uh, I asked you, anybody do the homework? Can you put my hand through there? Okay, good. You have those. I'll show you my list of 14 reasons from Colossians why he should have the preeminence. Come on with those verses. And I'll, there are a couple tricky ones. We'll go through those. Let's see. Oh, there's the whole scripture. I'm going to go right to my list. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Wonderful. Satan no longer controls us. Hallelujah. 
He conveyed us to the kingdom of his son of his love. If you see it in italics, that's a direct quote. I've added words here to convey it. So this is translation from one kingdom to another. Obviously, a reason for giving him preeminence. He has, he, we have redemption through his blood, our third point, and the forgiveness of sins, our fourth point. These are reasons for giving him the preeminence. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact likeness of the Father that we can see him in the flesh. And then, this one gets interesting. He is the firstborn over all creation. Amen. Now, that word firstborn you, has more than one meaning. Okay? And we're going to go, we're going to quick go look at that here. First meaning for firstborn literally means, and you see it there, oh, let's see, prototakos? Is that close? That's I'm close in the Greek. Oh, well, although you Okay. Uh, <laughs> it means, it, from two words, protos means first, and then tikto, or tikta, means to bear. First to bear means your firstborn son, your first son that you bear. So Jesus is called the firstborn son in Luke 2.7 when Mary gives birth to him. Mm -hmm. By the way, the birth was not miraculous. The conception was miraculous. The birth was very normal. She had a child like anyone else has a child. But what was in that child, through conception, was unique. So, but the other places we see Jesus being described as firstborn goes to the second meaning of the word. Just like in English, words in Greek and Hebrew can have several meanings. And usually, as Pastor Moore says, context is king. Context will show you which, what it means in which situation. So let's look at that, because you, if you haven't seen this before, you don't know what this is about. I have a definition here from Zodiades, uh, the firstborn of every creation. Let me read that to you. He is, uh, let's see, the firstborn of, of uh, Colossians 1.15, the firstborn of every creation best translates the one preeminent over all creation. Mm -hmm. Now, I see why they do this in Hebrew. The firstborn son gets the preeminence. He gets the lion's share of his inheritance, and he gets the greater blessing. He is preeminent. So that the idea of being most important, <coughs> being preeminent, comes from being the firstborn. That's, I believe that's why they're related to use that way in Hebrew, have both meanings. They're related. So when you say he's the firstborn of every creature, that does not mean he's the firstborn whale, and the firstborn horse, and the firstborn human. That's, that's not the meaning. That's not... It means he's preeminent in all these things, or as he says here, the one preeminent over all creation. Then he uses it again. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I have it here in Weist. He does a nice job of it. Who the Son has priority to and sovereignty over all creation. And that way he's the firstborn. Because in him was created all things in the heavens and the earth. That, that's... That's what's going on. Then, you see it again in verse 18. He is the firstborn from the dead. Now again, this does not mean firstborn in order. It means the most important, the preeminent one. Because other people were raised from the dead before Jesus was raised from the dead. He's not the first one to be raised from the dead. But he is the preeminent, he's the most important resurrection. By the way, in one way, he is the firstborn in order. Other people who were raised from the dead, after they were raised from the dead, they had to die a second time. Mm. That's right. His resurrection is eternal. Amen. He's raised from the dead Amen. to never die. Yes. No one else has done that. Mm. Yes, people have been raptured up. Yes, people have been raised from the dead. But no one's been raised and been eternal at their resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ is the first one to do that. So, th that's what those verses are about. Now, we're going to move on from there. Okay. Here's the question. How do you give Christ preeminence or first place or the superior place in all things? And we can give us some scriptures here because this is the nuts of bolts how to do this. If he has the preeminence, all kinds of wonderful things will flow. Grace will not be added to you, it will be multiplied to you. Amen. Undeserved loving kindness can be multiplied to you wherever Christ has the preeminence. When he has the preeminence, life can be fun. 
joyful, Amen. exciting. That doesn't mean there's no pain involved, but it, they're still glorious, okay? This is where we get into, you know, actually experiencing the glory and the presence of God and, and blessings multiplied to us. This is where we want to be. Let Him and Him alone be your first and foremost love. Now I'm going to explain how to do that. Because we only have one to say love in English. It can mean, I don't know, a bunch of different things. How, how do you do that? Well, we're going to go to the Scriptures here. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is how you love God. I cannot see God. I cannot hug Him. Okay, I, I can't... Sometimes I can feel him inside, if you will, because he dwells with us. But if I hear his word and keep it, I am loving God. That's Amen. how I love God. Amen. Now, when I think of this, I've had students who adored me, but they wouldn't do what I said. <laughs> <laughs> They're the most annoying kind of students on the earth. They're really more difficult. They bother me more than the kids just bad, you know, and I'm giving me trouble all the time. Oh, well, I want to be a wonderful guy. And I asked you to do an assignment. You didn't turn the thing in. Why are you talking when I'm teaching? And, you know, you know. Like, oh, anyways, they can do this. Uh, every kid is real polite and sweet, but don't do what they're told. Oh, I had somebody admit this. You know, this, it, anyway, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right, now, <laughs> how to do that, too. All right. Deuteronomy 6, 4, 9 gives us a clue. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Isn't it interesting we talk about the Lord being one? He brings that up here. Okay. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. When I ask people, what's the most important commandment? They usually say to me, well, in Deuteronomy, and Jesus, we'll see it in the New Testament, Jesus quoted it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your strength. My answer to them is, that's not the first commandment. Oh my goodness. Okay. Look at that carefully. Look at the beginning of verse 4. The first commandment is hear, O Israel. Believe. Oh, what? If I'm going to love God, I love God by keeping His commandment. I cannot keep His commandment unless I first what? Believe. Hear His commandment. This is in two parts. The first thing is I have to be a hearer of God's Word to actively and really really love him indeed. I just say, well, I have warm, gushy feelings about God, but I don't really obey him. And, you know, like a kid who does that. Or a spouse who does that. Anyways, it gets interesting. So, hear, O Israel. If you are a hearer of God's word, you can then begin to love him in a real way. So, we're going to go on with that theme. Okay. Psalm 119, verse 30. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. If I am a hearer of God's word, I have spiritual light to begin to see how to love him. If I don't hear God's word, I don't know how to love him. It's really, so it begins with hear, O Israel. Hear. Mm -hmm. And then I have light to begin to obey. So the scriptures, this, following this thing, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then you're going to see it again. He repeats it again in the same chapter. Remember, no exclamation marks in, in the Greek or Hebrew. You just repeat things to put the exclamation mark in. He repeats it twice. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Amen. Okay. So, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It becomes real when we hear the word and begin to respond to it with faith. The thing gets very real. Okay, and to stop there, we get a little camera break. We've got to turn off and turn on. What's our time?